Welcome to the Life Tracks Podcast. I'm your host, Marvin Bryson. For me, podcasting represents a modern take on oral storytelling traditions. Being born in the very last year of the baby boom, I'm closing in on retirement and have grown comfortable in embracing my role of elder in hopes that future generations might benefit from my experiences. An extra added bonus is that part of my history will also be available for my grandchildren should they want to know more about their pop-pop. As a teen, I landed my first paying gig as a musician. The year was 1979, so I have more than 40 years of stories to share in that venue. My music business background came into play because it informed my first motion picture gig as a music supervisor in 2001. The film was Blue Moon, the late great director Xavier Green's Howard University Fine Arts Thesis Project. Blue Moon aired on Showtime and marked the debut of notable comedic actress Coco Brown. From there, I focused on motion picture editing, completed a great avid editing program, and moved to Hollywood. Over the past 20 years, I have compiled over 200 credits on roughly 20 television series and films. So without further ado, let's get into track seven, Can't Quit You. The Apple One personal computer was introduced on April the 11th, 1976. IBM followed up on June 1st, 1979, changing the business world with the introduction of their 8088 personal computer. I'm a Mac guy, but typically on both Windows and Mac systems concurrently, more often than not. As I mentioned earlier, my brother owned his own computer company, specializing in Windows support and IBM clone sales. He gave me my own IBM clone with a huge dot matrix printer in 1987. I turned it on a couple of times, printing a test page or two in WordStar. But for the most part, it sat on top of my trusted drawers for nearly two years, doing nothing. It took me getting a special assignment at the insurance company I was working at, managing a PC-based relational database, for me to start paying attention to my own computer at home. Prior to the 1980s, the vast majority of computer operations took place in a mainframe computer environment requiring in-depth personalized training. PC computing power changed all that. I dipped my toe into PC technology, starting with peer-to-peer networks, and have never looked back. I experienced how technology fundamentally changed music production and distribution followed by filmmaking a decade or so later with broadband services improving. Fortunately, this afforded me the opportunity to make a living doing something I would have done for free. To circle back to the medical marketing firm I was working at being bought out, growth through acquisition was the business model of the day. So it was more like a merger for the rank and file employees. The CEO of the medical marketing firm shared the wealth by issuing every employee at the company's stock options based on tenure. Marty's generosity remains remarkable to me some 20-odd years later. I've never experienced anything like it before or since. Moving forward, the clinical research firm that bought us out was headquartered in Boston. A couple of weeks after the announcement, I got a rare visit from Marty. He came to my office to tell me that he had arranged for me to go corporate managing telecommunications at the clinical research company's seven North American offices. With call center integration driving the technical process and my track record in building out the network infrastructure in the Alexandria office, I wasn't a hard sell given the company's rapid growth. Marty then proceeded to tell me the terms of my new employment. The offer included a stipulation that I didn't have to move to Boston if I didn't want to, Essentially, the company was going to put me up for six months to see if I felt like the city was a good fit for me. And if it wasn't, I could work out of the Old Town Alexandria, Virginia office, just outside of Washington, D.C. Upon arriving in Boston, I was given the lay of the land there, including time with the Swiss-born, Harvard-educated CEO. I reported directly to a guy from MIT that gave me free reign to do what I needed to do to get the job done. So there I was, working with folks from Harvard and MIT, essentially curing cancer and AIDS. The next year was a blur of airplanes, meetings, build-outs, and being wined and dined by technology vendors, including a trip on a private jet. 
Boston was way too cold for me, so I opted to have DC as my home base. Prior to my promotion, my daughter and I had bonded nicely. It started with me taking her to school in the mornings at elementary school. Then when middle school came along, I took the lead on doctor's appointments and other work time events since I had a much more flexible schedule than her mom. After a year or so of my being gone more often than not, she and I were walking in the park one day and I asked her how things were going. She essentially expressed her displeasure with my absence by telling me, you need to get another job. Her words hit me hard with her being 15 at the time. I had dated entirely too many women with daddy issues, so I knew I had to make a choice. It was surprisingly easy to pick my kid over my ego or the pride I felt in telling people what I did for a living. Not to mention I was burnt out from the travel and fast-paced lifestyle that came along with that promotion. Prayerfully, I landed on my feet employment-wise. A few months later, I accepted a position as telecommunications manager at the largest healthcare trade association in America on Capitol Hill. They utilized the same phone system I had been working on for years, and with my healthcare background, I turned out to be a great fit for the gig. It was surreal to see my coworkers on the morning or nightly national news broadcast discussing healthcare policy three or four times a week. The best part of the job for me was that I was responsible for a single location with a staff of 100, no call center, and a 35-hour work week at the same salary. I did miss my expense account, though, but it was well worth losing it and all that job-related stress. I literally felt like I went from astronaut-level pressure to bike-riding-level pressure or no pressure at all. During this time, I completed my two-year degree, put a down payment on my first house with those stock options that I mentioned, and started to get that music itch again. Yes, Maria was right. I couldn't quit music. With my history in the business, I didn't want to do the same thing the same way, so I decided to approach things from the business angle of the show. So the first thing I did was take a music business and artist management class offered by the well-respected Omega Studio School. Omega is renowned for their studio engineering and live sound certification programs, having trained many well-respected and award-winning engineers. Fortunately for me, their music business and artist management curriculum was on par. Mary Chapin Carpenter's longtime manager, Tom Carrico, taught the artist management module. A Harry Fox rep handled publishing, and several attorneys addressed concerns regarding synchronization, cross-collateralization, and other legal aspects of the business. The class, combined with my paralegal training, left me in a great space to restart. From there, I put together a project studio on a popular Cakewalk platform, then started jamming with some of my old friends and sitting in with their bands to shake off the rust. One weekend, a dear friend, Rama, invited me along to a house party out in the Virginia Hunt Country foothills with the promise of a bonfire and live music. I vividly remember pulling up to this large 19th century era farmhouse estate. It was rustic, but well kept. As we were walking up, I heard this beautiful violin, cello, and acoustic guitar sound coming from inside. The door opened to a candlelit main room with a fire burning in the fireplace. I grabbed a beer and sat down to enjoy the show when the guitar player started to sing. His voice was powerful. When the song rapped, he spoke briefly about a CD they had for sale. I walked outside to the bonfire and found some folks were playing acoustic guitars, drinking and smoking. The guitars were being passed from person to person, with folks playing their favorite cover tunes or original compositions. When the guitar was passed to me, I played a cover of Boston's More Than the Feeling before passing it on. Inside, the band started another set, so I went back and enjoyed the show. Their playing was stellar and tight. I enjoy many styles of music, so after their set, I went up to John, the guitarist and vocalist, to purchase a CD. He was out at the bonfire and mentioned my playing. I told him my main instrument was bass. He replied by telling me there are several songs on their CD that included bass. I asked where their bass player was tonight, and essentially they didn't have one and hired a guy for the CD. 
I briefly spoke to John about my background, but also talked about my time off, then asked if I could come jam with them sometime. John gave me his email address and introduced me later that night to the violinist Jen and the cellist Amy. On the ride home, Rama and I listened to the CD. It was an eclectic and melodic mix in the vein of the Dave Matthews Band, but in a less accessible way insofar as there wasn't a signature sound per se, like most middle-of-the-road pop music. The next day, I woke up motivated, then got about the business of learning the bass line for our would-be jam session. <laughs> <laughs> 